it's Adam here for PC Monitors and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the ASUS ROG Swift or ROG Swift if you prefer OLED PG27 AQDM. As usual there's a full vision review accompanying the video review and you can find a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Also be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, good way of showing your support. As a video, remember that what you see depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately and importantly it depends on the screen that you're viewing the video on, so it doesn't accurately represent what you'd see first hand using the monitor. This monitor uses a 26.5 inch OLED panel, W OLED from LG Display, and this has a 2560 by 1440, 1440p or QHD resolution, and supports a 240Hz refresh rate. So you get good multitasking potential with this resolution, and you get a decent amount of clarity as well as a decent pixel density. Of course, not as much desktop real estate as a 4K UHD resolution, and you can't expect the same kind of text clarity or clarity to suitably high resolution image content as that either. But a significant improvement compared to Full HD. When it comes to text clarity and let's say edge clarity, you have to be aware that this monitor uses a bit of a strange sub-pixel layout. I've just popped up a macro on the screen, a macro photograph showing the sub-pixel layout. So what I've shown here is a little stripe, a vertical stripe with one pixel dot of red, followed by white, followed by blue, followed by green. The black space shows subpixels that aren't active for that particular dot. And this allows you to see the order of the subpixels. And you can see that it goes red, white, blue, green. So it's an RWBG layout. So very different to the usual RGB. That white subpixel is necessary. It's part of the WOLED design of this panel and it's shared with others which use a WOLED panel, an LG display WOLED panel, and it's used for the brightness of the monitor. So it's basically unfiltered white light for that subpixel. And because of this strange subpixel layout, it means if you're using clear type with windows, that's optimizing either for RGB or BGR. And I would recommend selecting RGB if you're wanting to use clear type. So that means you select the first sample there. If you select the second sample, that's BGR. And that actually looks really strange on this monitor. But there are some issues if you do select RGB and you use clear type. Unfortunately, it isn't possible to show this accurately in photos and certainly not videos of the monitor. So if you look at the calibration section of the Vision Review, I give a lot of examples of this fringing, which occurs if you're using clear type. And there's also some issues that occur with fringing if you're not using clear type. If you don't use clear type, then text tends to have a quite narrow and sort of weird appearance with uneven bolding. And I just don't like that look at all. I'm very used to using clear type. It's been used by default in Windows for a long time. I'm used to how text looks with that, and I generally prefer that. But with this monitor, sort of, I'm a bit conflicted because I do find the fringing very obvious. It is explored in more detail in the vision review, so I'm just going to give some quick examples of what I see. Again, you're not going to be able to see this in the video, but when I look at smaller text, like this text here, the main paragraph text, it sort of just looks a little bit like the sharpness of the monitor is not set correctly, and that's because it does have a little bit of a fringe. And larger text, I find the fringing even more noticeable. There's actually sort of a distinct shadow around the text displaced to the left. Again, you're not going to be able to see this in the video. You might think you can see it, but um, that's probably just some weird processing artifacts with the video if you are seeing anything. It's subjective how annoying you might find this fringing. Personally, I do notice it here. If the monitor had a much tighter pixel density, then the fringing would be more difficult to notice, but it doesn't. It's how it is, and all of the current W OLED panels have this kind of pixel density, or if you're looking at TVs, even lower. So it's going to be an issue there. When I covered the Dell Alienware AW3423DW, which has its own fringing issues with text and fine edges, I noticed that there is a fringe which is quite colourful around dark objects in particular against a light background, so that can be seen pretty clearly in my table of contents here that I have in my reviews and some of my articles. On this model though, on the ASUS, you don't see any particular fringing of note around the table edge, and for the text, you can see a little bit, but it's not so bad. So for these kind of high contrast situations, it's okay, but with the QD OLEDs, looking at the main text, and I'd be using clear type because I prefer that, I actually didn't have any particular issues with fringing on the QD OLEDs. And what I mean by that is I did notice it, but it didn't bother me. Whereas on this model, it does kind of bother me. But there are some really odd 
issues which have nothing to do with clear type on this model as well. And these can be seen where you have colours such as yellow, turquoise or green against a bright or light coloured background. For the yellow I can see a distinct red line on the left and I can see a bright cyan to green line on the right, that's a fringe. For turquoise and green I see a dark fringe on the left, it looks essentially black. And to the right I can see that cyan fringe again, it's a little bit less bright, a little bit less noticeable I find than with the yellow. But other shades can show this as well, oranges, you can sometimes see these fringes with pinks as well. This has nothing to do with clear type, if you've got clear type disabled you can see all the same and it's not just for highlighted text, I'm just showing you this as an example. It would be for objects with those colours as well. And again this is explored in more detail in the vision review, if you're interested in this definitely check that out. It is something to be aware of. One of the examples I give is that you can see this fringing for folder icons as well, various UI elements you might find on the desktop. So. Because of these issues, I don't generally recommend this monitor for heavy productivity focused workloads. That's not to say you can't necessarily use it for that kind of thing. If you're occasionally on the internet or doing a little bit of work with the monitor, you might not find this too bothersome, it's very subjective, but in general, I do find this monitor is more at home when you're watching more dynamic content such as movies and games, and there I didn't have any issues with fringing. I'm just going to briefly talk about image retention and burn-in. They're two separate things really. Image retention is something which can be quite mild and usually clears up when you use the monitor normally if you do notice any. I haven't noticed any image retention, certainly no burn-in over my short review period of the monitor, but I cannot speak for longer use. It is something which it is a concern, an understandable concern when it comes to OLED technology, particularly if you're going to be using it for many productivity focused workloads lots of static elements on the screen, that kind of thing. The monitor does have some mitigation measures to try and reduce this. You'll find these mitigation features in system setup screen protection. They're explored in more detail in the vision review in the image retention and burn-in section. Yes, there was a little bit of a dedicated section there, but again, I haven't used this monitor for a long period of time, so I can't speak for what might happen over time. But there are some things you can do to reduce the chance of having issues with this, and these mitigation measures can help, but you can individually enable and disable some of these mitigation measures. I'm now going to look at the external features of the monitor. So it has a distinctive ROG gamery look. Nice coated metal stand, really solid, gives a really solid footing, good premium feel to the base there. The stand neck itself is plastic, but the stand base is metal. If you really want to rock things up, you can. So there's a downfiring projector. There's a little light feature on the stand there. There's one at the back as well. Okay, there are two at the back, one on either side. Those ones are classified as Aura RGB, although they're always red. I'm more of a deep red than the sort of orangey red you see in the video. And this is the same red, but it's not classified as Aura RGB. It's just a power indicator and you can turn that off if you prefer, just like you can turn the base lights off if you prefer. And there's also this rather attractive Aura Sync feature at the rear, this ROG Swift logo, which you can customise in the OSD. All of these lighting features are explored in the OSD video. Dual stage bezels are used at all sides of the screen, so you can see a panel border that's flush with the rest of the screen, that's the black bit. Although from casual glance when it's switched off it's quite difficult to see that. There's also an active area which is a little area around the image, between the panel border and the image. The screen surface is what I would classify as medium or relatively light matte anti-glare. It certainly has strong glare handling or relatively strong glare handling. That means you don't have to worry about reflections, it's very far from a glossy screen surface but it's quite strong for a matte screen surface and that does have some implications for the image which I'll explore in the contrast section a little later. But you will see that I've got a bright light there and there isn't really a sharp glassy glare patch, it's really quite heavily diffused the light across the screen. More Republic of Gamers branding at the rear. Outside of this central area you've got matte black plastic and you'll see the screen itself, the panel, is very slim indeed, then the central area bulks out more. The monitor includes an integrated heat sink, it doesn't have a fan, it doesn't have an active cooling solution, it's a passive cooling solution, and that distinguishes it from competing models like the LG27GR95QE. 
You can also use the center of the stand neck as a cable tidy. You can see the OSD controls there. They're explored in the OSD video. At the top, there is a tripod or screw socket. And the port's face downwards, so there's a DC power input. It has an external power brick. It's a quite compact design. It's sort of like a half power brick. It's not as long as most power bricks. There's a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Two HDMI 2.0 ports with some HDMI 2.1 features. I'll come on to that shortly. There's a Kensington lock slot, K slot. There's display port 1.4 with DSC. And there are two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports plus a Type B upstream. So in terms of the capabilities of the ports, so full capabilities, you want to be using DisplayPort 1.4. That will give you 240 hertz at the native QHD resolution. You can also get HDR and Adaptive Sync supported via DisplayPort, which means you can use AMD FreeSync as well as NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, for example. Although this monitor is advertised as HDMI 2 ports, that's because of the bandwidth. It will be limited to 120 hertz at the QHD resolution. There's also a 4K UHD downsampling mode which can run it up to 60 hertz, so that would be useful for the Xbox Series X, for example, where you need to be using the 4K UHD resolution to use HDR. But unlike the competing LG, you can't do that at 120 hertz, the 4K UHD resolution. But you get HDR, you get variable refresh rate support via adaptive sync, and also HDMI 2.1 VRR, so that's an HDMI 2.1 feature you get, even if you don't have the bandwidth. That means you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode via HDMI, it also means you should be able to use VRR on the PS5, which doesn't support adaptive sync, but can use this HDMI 2.1 VRR. In the written review, I give various measurements, for example, the depth of the stand. It's a fairly deep stand, as you can see. I mean, this is a bit chunky, I should say, but it's not as deep as some ROG designs and some gaming monitors. So you can kind of make it work if you don't have the deepest desk. But if you prefer, you can remove the stand. You've got 100 by 100 millimeter VESA holes for alternative mounting, and an adapter bracket is included with the monitor. If you want to use the included stand, you get full ergonomic flexibility. So you can adjust the height, you can tilt it, you can swivel it, and you can also rotate it clockwise or anti-clockwise into portrait orientation. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about contrast performance. The monitor has an essentially infinite contrast ratio as an OLED screen. It's able to completely shut off some pixels whilst the others are at the required brightness. So that means it's able to maintain excellent depth and atmosphere. The darker shades, it's also able to give really nice solidity and depth to medium shades where required as well. LCDs in comparison, they have a little bit of a sort of translucent quality, especially if they have a fairly low contrast ratio. And it's also extremely consistent. So there isn't any IPS glow or VA glow or any glow of any description to worry about. Any glow you see is down to the camera or the video or perhaps the game if it has that kind of effect. It's not something which the monitor will add itself. Beautifully consistent in that respect. And that really does aid the atmosphere in games like this. So lots of dark passageways and tombs and interior locations on Tomb Raider. But as I mentioned, it can help with the solidity of the medium shades as well. And it can also help with the definition, the structural definition of various objects as well, because of this really strong contrast. It's really nice in that respect. The gamma consistency is excellent as well, so you don't get variable levels of detail at different points of the screen. All LCD panel types will show that to some degree. IPS shows that the least. They have relatively strong gamma consistency, but even then it's not quite as strong as what you can see here. In terms of the gamma tuning, my unit was quite good in terms of sticking pretty close to the 2.2 curve. For the very dark shades, it did show a little bit of masking of detail, so that's to say that the gamma was just a touch too high there in places, but it's not an extreme masking of detail. It's not as much as I would see on VA models when I talk about Black Crush, and also be aware that there's an inconsistency there on the VA models because the Black Crush is more central and then peripherally you can actually see excessive detail, but as I said, the, the gamma consistency here is exceptional, so there's really very even look throughout the screen. And again, this is just a minor loss of detail, which I'm talking about here. Some units might not show it. There are some gamma changes as well, depending on the brightness you set, but these weren't as pronounced as I saw on the Dell Alienware AW3423DW. So the overall representation, I think people are going to be very happy with in terms of the contrast. An issue of contention with this one is that matte anti-glare screen surface, and as I mentioned, it's what I would classify as a medium matte anti-glare screen surface, or a relatively light, perhaps. 
matte anti-glare screen surface. So there is a certain degree of graininess when you observe brighter content. And there's also a certain degree of layering in front of the image. So you're sort of just aware of the structure of the screen surface. That's not something you get on a glossy screen surface and you don't get it to such an extent on some matte screen surfaces. Quite a few of the IPS options, for example, that are 240 hertz QHD, they have lighter matte screen surfaces than this, so there's not quite as much layering or graininess. It's not something which is going to bother everyone, to be honest, and the glare handling is very strong. Speaking of which, I'm just going to lighten the room up a bit. There we go. It's not a bright day, not a particularly bright day outside, so it's not super bright in here or anything, just a bit of brightness. And there is a little bit of light striking the screen directly here as well. I've done that on purpose so I can show you that it is diffusing that light pretty heavily across the screen surface. That's what matte anti-glare screen surfaces do, and particularly ones which are a little bit on the more aggressive side, like this one, they'll do that quite strongly. So some matte screen surfaces might show sort of a bit of a sharp reflection or sharp glare patch, I should say, here. Glossy screen surfaces, like you get on the QD OLEDs, you might get reflections here. They'd be sharp reflections. You don't get this sort of diffused glare in the same way across the screen surface. And what this diffused glare does, I mean, to some people, it's sort of something they can filter out and ignore, but it will flood the image. You can see that the, <laughs> you can't really say that the depth of the dark shades is very good there at the moment, where that glare patch is and it's diffused across the screen, giving a bit of a sort of hazing to the image. That's one of the reasons some people prefer glossy screen surfaces. They don't have that kind of hazing effect to the image with ambient light, but on the flip side, some people don't like the reflections. They can't filter those out as well. The sharp reflections can bother some people. So I'm not going to say too much more about this. It's pretty personal, pretty subjective. You know, I'm, I'm a kind of a fan of lighter matte screen surfaces in this, and I do like glossy screen surfaces. And I'm going to talk about colour reproduction, and I like to start off with Legom, legom.nl, the website and the test for viewing angles there. And they're really good for highlighting issues with colour consistency. The Legom text here, it looks very weird on this monitor, and that's because of the sub-pixel issues, the fringing. I can see a clear red or magenta fringe to the left, blue fringe to the right of the text. You don't get the kind of variability you get on LCDs in terms of particularly TN and VA, where you would see shifts between more saturated reds and greens and oranges, that kind of thing. Nothing like that. Solid shades, this looks nice and consistent, very nice and consistent here. It doesn't look that way on the video, I'm sure. It looks like there's a kind of ball of pink in the middle. It looks more purple towards the edges. That's not what you see to the eye, so just ignore that. Red block, really nice, consistent, rich red throughout the screen. Green block, nice, consistent green throughout the screen. And even on IPS LCDs, you'd see some variation here. There is a little bit of lightening up. You can't really see it so much because of the scroll bar, just a little bit to the extreme right side of the screen. And I explore uniformity, by the way, in more detail in the written review if you're interested in this kind of thing. But any kind of shifts you see here, particularly for colourful elements, they're really minor. So the uniformity is excellent. Same with the blue block, nice rich royal blue throughout the screen. I'm on Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. So this monitor has a generous colour gamut. It extends beyond sRGB. I'll just show the gamut on the screen. So you can see that, and bear in mind that depending on the calibration device, the software you use, that can lead to slightly different measurements here. But overall, it's going to show similar sort of path to the gamut. The thing to be aware of is that significant extension beyond sRGB. And the reason for that is that most content is designed with the sRGB gamut in mind when the developers create content under SDR. And that would be if you're in-game, if you're on the desktop, browsing the internet, whatever it might be, it's usually sRGB, which is the standard, and that's what the developers and content creators have in mind. And when you have an untamed gamut, which is wider than that, as you do in this case, if you're using the native gamut of the monitor, then it invites extra saturation and extra vibrancy. So I can see this in this game, for example. The sky blues are quite oversaturated, but not extremely oversaturated, so they don't have the sort of cartoonish look they have on some models, but I suppose you could say they verge a little bit towards that. And some of the greens really stand out a bit too much. The grass here, for example, has the yellowish greens brought out too strongly. And some of the green shades just stand out more than they should. They're not as muted as they should be, but they're still good variety. And the earth as well has a bit of a reddish quality. In this particular scene, it's not too bad, but some woody tones, some earthy tones as well. They just don't look as neutral as they should because of the red push. And again, the exceptional consistency of the screen 
means that it's very even throughout the screen. The saturation levels, there aren't shifts when you compare the center to the edges of the screen or anything like that. So, so it maintains this vibrancy really nicely throughout the screen. The flames as well in the background there would help if I didn't use the thermal scope. That wasn't really a very useful thing to do when I'm talking about colors, but the flames there, nice and vibrant, but you get some yellows verging on orangey yellow and oranges which verge a bit too much on red, but definitely vibrant, definitely eye-catching. If you want things to look more as the developers intend instead, you don't want this oversaturation, then you can activate the sRGB setting on the monitor. There is actually an sRGB preset which will do this, but that will lock off some of your options without giving you an advantage over the method I'm about to show you. And that's simply to go to color and change display color space to sRGB instead of DCI-P3. And the nice thing about this sRGB emulation mode, it clamps the gamut close to sRGB, does very well in that respect, but it also gives you really nice flexibility. It doesn't lock any of your settings off. So you can see I can control my brightness, control my contrast, the things which are greyed out are just greyed out because of the preset I'm using, but you can actually use a different preset with this sRGB setting as well. Have full control over gamma. You have your colour temperature settings, and that includes the user setting where you can control the red, green and blue colour channels. So this is a really good flexible sRGB emulation setting. It does well overall to give pretty faithful output within the sRGB colour space. So if you do prefer this more toned down as the developers intend look, then this is certainly something you can use. So the sky blues are more muted now. The greens I was showing you before, a bit overdone, are more muted now as well. And a more neutral look to those earthy browns as well. And the sort of the muddy colours, less of a red tint there. And fire as well, certainly less vivid. It doesn't have the kind of red push that it had before. So if you're using this monitor for colour critical work or content creation, you can certainly expect good results within the sRGB colour space for DCI-P3 as well. There's good coverage of that, very good coverage of that, but you would ideally be calibrating the monitor with your own colorimeter or similar device. If you're working within the Adobe RGB colour space, then I measured 90% Adobe RGB. There's incomplete coverage there. It doesn't have enough coverage in the green to blue region of the gamut. So unlike the QD OLED models, it doesn't offer full or nearly full Adobe RGB coverage. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm running the game and the monitor in HDR. So the monitor will accept an HDR10, respond to an HDR10 colour signal. Your options are very limited under HDR on the monitor. So there's ASUS Gaming HDR, ASUS Cinema HDR, ASUS Console HDR and Brightness Adjustable. Whichever of these modes you choose, Brightness Adjustable by the way is a toggle which you can activate on top of any of these modes. The image is exactly the same, or was on my unit, regardless of what you select here. That could depend on firmware, could potentially depend on your GPU or your system as well. But I tested with an RTX 3090 via HDMI 2.1 and DisplayPort 1.4 and it was exactly the same. At the time I'm doing this video, I haven't done any testing with my AMD GPU, but I will make observations using my AMD GPU in the vision review as well. So check that just in case there are any changes, but hopefully it's a very consistent experience with HDR on the AMD and Nvidia side. Generally it is. And this isn't one of those monitors that has AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, which can give you a different HDR pipeline if you're using an AMD graphics card with FreeSync enabled. So you don't have to worry about that kind of possible inconsistency there. But you can actually use VRR on this monitor on the AMD or Nvidia side at the same time as HDR. So if you enable the brightness adjustable toggle, that actually tells you HDR PQ curve will be affected when the brightness adjustment is on under HDR mode. So this will just unlock your brightness control. If you reduce that at all below 100, then you're affecting that PQ curve. Really things are optimized to run at a brightness of 100 under HDR, and that's what it would be if you have this slider disabled, so you haven't selected that little checkbox. If you reduce it below that, then things tend to just look sort of washed out. You don't get the kind of dynamic range you should. It just drags things down and eventually it sort of muddies things. It's almost like the gamma's messed up under SDR if you were doing this under SDR. It really is just optimized and tuned for this to be set at 100. But if you find that too bright and it's just unbearable for you and you need to reduce the brightness, then that's what that option is for. Other setting of note, color temperature, two options here, 6500K and 8200K. The actual color temperature does depend on the brightness and can depend on the content that you're looking at, but 
on my unit, the 6500K setting was certainly closer to that. It was a little bit above. I measured 6700, I think it was. But for the 8200K, I measured even above that. I think it was 8700K. So that is a very cool white point gives a very bluish look to things and that can accelerate visual fatigue. It could be uncomfortable for some users. So I really wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend sticking to the 6500K. The reason you might want to use the other option is because it does increase the brightness a little bit. So I'm just gonna show you some figures on the screen and I'll, I'll run through what this monitor is capable of when it comes to brightness under HDR. So the blue line here is using that 8200K setting, the green line, the 6500K setting, and the orange line is the Dell Alienware AW3423DW to represent the QD OLED ultrawides, just for comparison. And you can see that even using the 6500K setting, the peak luminance recorded was 926 nits, which is actually pretty good. That's not too far below 1000 nits, which is specified or claimed for this model. And the H200K setting allowed it to go above that closer to 1100 nits i measured 1092 but you know pretty close to that so you'll see that really the the differences in brightness here aren't dramatic between the two modes and it generally outperforms the qd oled a little bit and depending on the setting you use it might be a little bit brighter or a little bit dimmer than the qd oled but the brightness does heavily depend on all monitors and in all modes on the white patch size which is the x-axis there 1% 4% 9% 25% 49% or 100% for those who aren't aware you have a white square in the middle of the screen surrounded by pure black and the size of the white square either covers 1% 4% 9% 25 49 or 100% of pixels so with 100% you don't get any black on the screen that's a full white screen and this is actually a sustained reading for 100% the rest are peak readings but actually the peak and sustained for most of these particularly the smaller patch sizes very similar anyway so you don't really have to worry about that with all this in mind I wouldn't really recommend the 8200k setting for reasons I mentioned before and the fact that the brightness yes it is a bit higher but this isn't really dramatic difference and I did actually compare the Alienware side by side with this model I did some testing unfortunately I can't show you videos of that testing oil there's no point because it really isn't something which can be accurately represented i even took some footage in hdr to see if i could show some differences but it wasn't possible so it's not something i'm going to include but really the overall brightness experience i found largely similar between them you can see that the alienware did drop a bit more at nine percent patch size in comparison to this asus but it had a bit of a brightness advantage for 100% sustained and 49%, so where bright shades dominate. But really, you can see a huge drop on both models if you're looking at brighter shades dominating on the screen. And again, I will explore that subjectively to give you more of an idea of what that might look like in-game. Another advantage under HDR is that the monitor is using 10-bit color processing, and that's used by the game content as well. And that gives you an enhanced nuanced shade variety. It also allows the monitor to more accurately tone map and also put its gamut to good use. So it's very useful under HDR. It's really an important part of the whole sort of look under HDR. It does increase the nuanced shade variety, these dark shades. And with the per pixel illumination, it really sort of marries together really well here. So I don't know what this will look like on the video, but the dark cracks in the rocks, they're extremely deep. And there are some just very slightly brighter shades right next to it. Just a really lovely variety of very dark shades here. And the medium shades have good depth to them as well. The bright crosshair there, there's no haloing or anything like that to worry about, no blooming, just an immediate transition between the white and the essentially black surrounding it, or the very dark shades and the very light shades, the combinations. And the HUD elements there, the same thing. They can be nice and bright, whereas immediately surrounding that can just shut off the pixels or have them much dimmer. So no haloing or blooming to worry about as you get with mini LED solutions. I'm now on Cyberpunk 2077, running the game under HDR again. I am just going to flick between various different games and scenes, so I'm sorry if that's a bit disorienting, but it just helps me increase the sort of range of scenes I show and talk about. So with this scene here, this is one I used on the AW3423DW to talk about the automatic brightness limiter, and I showed you that with the graph as well. You could see that when bright shades dominate, the screen does dim. It won't come across properly in the video, but just sort of be aware of what I'm saying. If you compare that to that, the bright shades there are very bright indeed, really lovely natural look to the daylight there. There it's maintained a little bit, but there's a bit of dimming, and where the bright shades really dominate, it just dims quite significantly. 
and it's not just the bright shades you can actually see shifts when you look at the hud element so that little man down there or the character down there and i've actually got most of the hud elements turned off because i was just doing some photos on this game before but there you go i've got my hud elements back so you can see the map you can see other things draw weapon and you can see the shifts more readily there. You can see them with the HUD elements. I, I can see them anyway. I'm not sure how to look on the video. I'm afraid the camera will be compensating for the shifts. But they are there, and certainly this is dimmer than that. And you can see it with the grey shades on the pavement as well, the shifts, because it's not just the bright shades, it's a sort of whole screen shift. The reason OLEDs do this is power limitations. It can't display the same brightness that it's showing there for the bright shades if that's shown everywhere on the screen because that would require more power. So it's a power limitation, which OLEDs do have. And as I showed with the graph, it is a bit less aggressive than on the QD OLED models. So I can see more of the brightness on the screen at the same time before it'll start dimming. I mean, that is nice, but I still notice the dimming and certainly for bright dominant scenes, I do feel that they're just less impressive than scenes where there was sort of bright highlight or just smaller areas of bright shade on the screen, more mixed content really with some good sort of darker areas as well. And that's exactly what you get in this scene at night. It's exactly the same scene just at night instead of in the day. Really nice bright look to the moon there. It's not as bright as I've seen on some of the mini LED models. And I'm just going to change the exposure of the camera again just to show you it's not a giant ball of brightness. You can actually see the distinct detail of the moon as well. And even with the camera exposure changed a lot, it sort of doesn't really look like it does to the eye. But never mind, you just have to take my word for it. Pretty bright, but not as bright as I've seen on some of the mini LED solutions, similar to what I saw on the Alienware though. Same with this street lamp there as well, nice and bright. And the neon lights in the background, really nice brightness to them. Can pump out excellent brightness and then it can keep the surrounding darker shades nice and deep. Although this particular game isn't the best for talking about that kind of thing because it just naturally, because of the art direction, it doesn't really have the, the deepest dark shades. That's just how they've designed the game. But even so, there's still a lot of contrast here and the monitor is able to immediately show very bright shades and much darker shades surrounding it. So the light there, for example, there isn't a haloing, which I'd usually see on mini LEDs for that particular light. And just really the smaller bright elements, the light up there as well. It's just the pixels around it can be immediately dark. And you will see some haloing naturally when you're looking at the game, but that's actually the game itself. It's not from the monitor, so there's no additional haloing from the monitor because of its per pixel illumination. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and this is a scene I like to show particularly with mini LED monitors because they show the scene very nicely. There's a certain luminosity to the sky, I love saying that. The brightness to the sun there and the glints on the icy surface there. That is lost a bit in this case because of the automatic brightness limiter. The monitor is certainly not pumping out its maximum luminance levels for all of these bright elements, these little bright highlights here. And when I say little bright highlights, you'll notice that a lot of the screen often shows a lot of bright shade, and that's the issue. If I'm just showing you a little bit of bright shade, like there, then actually the, the brightness is really impressive. But again, it's the, the brightness limiter when more of the bright shade is shown. So I'm not going to say too much more about this scene. I just wanted to include this in the rotation because I like to use this when I'm showing you mini LED solutions and I often praise them there. But it isn't like things look completely dull or washed out and just... It's just in comparison to what the mini LEDs can show here. And actually, this scene is a bit better than on the Alienware, and that's again because the monitor is able to pump out better brightness as bright shades start to dominate. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, again with HDR, and I'm going to stick to Tomb Raider for the rest of this section. The sun there, nice and bright, and lots of nice bright shade up there as well and the 10-bit color reproduction helps with the nuanced shade variety so there are gentler progressions of shade, gentler gradients, smoother more natural looking gradients but this does depend on the game and actually the scene in the game it is up to the developers to make good use of this so it doesn't just automatically mean everything's going to look smooth and amazing it's also able to show nice depth there for the dark shades the medium shades good depth to them and showing the bright shades at the same time however there is some peculiarity with how it shows these very bright shades and this isn't specific to this game it's actually a limitation with the technology used and I have observed this on other games as well by the way and it's not an issue with HDR calibration either it is actually physical limitation and that's because of that pesky white subpixel because the monitor is using that white subpixel at a very bright level that unfiltered white subpixel 
and that really dominates and sort of waters down, if you like, the colours. So that's really a much less technical way of saying it reduces the colour volume. So the monitor is pumping out a lot of pure, unfiltered white light, whereas there's not so much light that's being filtered through the red, green and blue subpixels. So I can see for the glint of light here, really nice and bright, every bit as bright as on the Alienware, for example, but it doesn't look smooth. What you have is this sort of pure white core, then you have yellow surrounding it, then you have orange surrounding that. And that's really just because the monitor can't display this particular element as it should look, and that is just a warm white throughout, nicely blended, and that's how it looks like on the Alienware how it would look like on mini LED monitors, unless they have some other issue. Again, this isn't something you can notice or see in the video. It doesn't matter what I set the camera exposure to. You really can't see what I'm seeing by eye or what you can see by eye. This scene is a good example of this as well. The bright light there, really nice and bright, really eye-catching, just as good as it was on the Alienware. And I mean, technically the brightness can be higher on some of the mini LED models I've looked at, the Asus PG32UQX, for example, that can really reach incredible brightness. And that's even when bright shades dominate, not just when there's a little bright section like there is here. But the contrast here is really exceptional. So I look at that bright shade there, really nice dark shades in the background, and again, a really nice nuanced shade variety. So I can see little details with the brickwork there as well, or the stonework. So the little details are there, but some of the dark shades are exceptionally deep and inky. Just the immediate transitions between the two as well. Really nice, lovely Perpix illumination doing its thing there. But when I look at this, and again, you can't see this in the video, this should look a blended cool white with a little bit of a sort of bluish purple quality to it. Whereas here you get a white core and surrounding that you get this kind of silvery bluish purple ring. It looks like a kind of posterization effect. And this is again just because it can't show bright saturated shades, it can only show brightness and saturation separately. Really odd. Um, you know, it's not something that everyone's going to necessarily notice when they're just playing a game. It's something that my keen eye for colour does notice, I was drawn into, and I am aware of this technical limitation as well, so I was kind of looking out for it to be honest. Another scene which highlights this, I know this is going to get a little bit repetitive because you're again not going to be able to see this in the video, but I'm just going to talk you through it. So there are some really nice rich reds and I will talk about colour reproduction using another scene a little bit later on, but yeah, there are some nice rich red hues. The colour gamut really is helpful here. And there's some pretty bright looking shades as well. But when I look at the brightest shades that are being displayed, but where the monitor's again trying to ideally be showing extreme brightness and saturation, like here, this will just look like a giant ball of light really on the video. But to the eye, the lava here has a sort of quite a flat look really, the flowing lava, sort of bright but pinkish. And the flames there have that posterization effect again with a white core surrounded by less bright yellow and orange, where what you should be able to see is you should be able to see stripes of brightness, stripes of intensely saturated orange and red and yellow as well. It should just look more blended, everything going at the same time, and that's how it looks on the QD OLEDs and, and the mini LED solutions for that matter. But this monitor just can't show both at the same time. Again, a W OLED limitation. I'm back on the scene I showed you when I was talking about contrast, and this is a scene which I usually find a bit less impressive, well, quite a bit less impressive actually, on mini LED solutions. And that's because the game is telling the monitor, so to speak, that they're supposed to be a very deep look to a lot of these dark shades here, really extreme depth. But there are still actually some little details which are supposed to be brought out. With mini LED solutions, they aren't able to do that. They have to dark bias to make sure the depth of those dark shades are good, which really dulls down some of the sort of dark to medium shades, the skulls, the bones that are shown here. You won't be able to see them in the video because it's extremely dark. And again, this is the nuanced shade variety coming into play here. You get some very slightly brighter, but still dark shades. They're all displayed very nicely here. I mean, overall, I think they're displayed nicely here, certainly compared to the mini LED solutions where you just get that loss of detail because of the dark biasing. Alternatively, they could bright bias, but then you'd get the 
visibility but you don't get the same depth of the dark shades. The Purpixel illumination allows this monitor to achieve both of those things. Really nice. And good brightness as well when I draw the bow here in the middle and around the torch. And the HUD elements that come up there, even with the very dark shades surrounding it, there's no haloing, no blooming. Again, the Purpixel illumination doing its thing. So I just wanted to include this scene as well just because I showed you it with contrast and it really does look very impressive on this monitor under HDR. I'm on a different scene and I'm going to focus more on the colour reproduction side of things. So I kind of talked about that with the white subpixel, but a lot of the shades that you'll see under HDR, they're not going to be those brightly saturated shades. You're going to get some colourful elements like the leaves here, Laura's dress there, and the colour gamut is put to really good use here. And unlike under SDR, the developers are actually targeting wider colour spaces, DCI-P3 and ultimately Rec 2020 and the monitor doesn't offer full Rec 2020 coverage, but it offers nearly full DCI-P3 coverage, so some encroachment into Rec 2020. Not as much as the QD OLED models, so I do notice that the green shades here look a little bit more lush and vibrant on the QD OLED, and yes, there are some screen surface differences which can kind of come into play perceptively there, but it's really, the color gamut isn't as wide on this model, and certainly I've seen a lusher look to these green shades on some of the mini LED solutions like the ASUS PG32UQX. Really, really generous gamut there in the green to blue region. But I would not describe what this monitor is showing as anything other than vibrant. Still is really nice lush look and really nice variety to the greens. And because the wide colour gamuts like this are being targeted, Laura's skin looks neutral, looks as it should. It doesn't look overdone. She doesn't look too tanned as she does under SDR. The, the little fire there as well doesn't have the kind of reddish push to the oranges. Just nice vibrant oranges and yellows as it should appear. The earthy browns as well, more neutral. There's not that red push I was talking about before. I know I was showing you Battlefield, but exactly the same thing applies. So overall, really a nice HDR experience. It is a shame about that white subpixel. Because of this, I was left a bit less impressed than I was on the QD OLED monitor, but I do still think it offers a rich and dynamic HDR experience. Shows a good level of vibrancy, and it shows some really nice bright elements, and it can sustain decent brightness levels where bright shades start to dominate. Of course, when they completely dominate, yes, the ABL kicks in, Again, though it's a little bit less aggressive than on the QD OLED, so that could be considered an advantage on this monitor in comparison. And actually the overall brightness levels, really I think ASUS has pushed this panel very well in that respect. I haven't yet reviewed any of the others myself, such as the LG 27GR95QE, but I will be doing that shortly, so of course I will be comparing and taking figures using the same methodology so we can compare because this ASUS monitor with its heat sink, that should offer some improvements to its brightness capability. I'm now on Battlefield 5. I've got the game running at 240 frames a second solidly at the moment. And this is a 240Hz monitor, so I'm making the most out of the monitor in terms of its responsiveness. This really does give exceptional visual fluidity. When it comes to responsiveness on a monitor, one of the aspects to be aware of with this high frame rate, high refresh rate combination is that it increases the connected feel. So that's how things feel when you're interacting with the game world, the precision, the fluidity felt. Low input lag helps in that respect. And this monitor does really well because it's got 240Hz refresh rate where it's pumping out up to four times as much visual information every second as a 60 hertz monitor. Plus, it has very low input lag. I measured under one and a half milliseconds, so it has a really nice low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. Really impressive in that respect. And the visual fluidity is exceptional, because not only have you got the advantages of the refresh rate, but it's put to full use because the monitor has exceptionally fast pixel responses and it achieves that without any drawbacks such as perceivable overshoot or anything like that. So this is far beyond what you'd get on an LCD. So I'm just going to show you some pursuit photographs to reinforce this idea. It's compared here to the Gigabyte Aorus FI27QX, which is a moderately fast 240Hz IPS model. And you can see that there's some powdery trailing with the Gigabyte. I'll often talk about this in my videos. And if you look at the detail on the UFO itself, it is much better on the ASUS as well. It maintains 
subtle details better. And actually the detail levels are even better than they're shown here, as you can actually count those white notches really clearly. They're very well defined. You can clearly count them. I know you can see them in the photo, but they're even clearer to the eye. What this means in practice, and even if you consider faster models than the Gigabyte Aorus LCDs, so if you were to consider the BenQ Zowie XL2566K, which is a very fast TN model, that has some isolated weaknesses as well. Not only do you get overshoot, which you don't get any of, and no perceivable overshoot whatsoever on this ASUS, you also get some isolated weaknesses in terms of slower than optimal pixel responses, particularly for bright shades. So if you think about those little notches on the UFO, they would actually be blended even on the BenQ model, even at a high refresh rate, in fact, because the really weaknesses related to the pixel responses. So it's really difficult to convey this. It's really something you'd have to see in person, and it's something which some users are more sensitive to than others. It's certainly something I'm sensitive to, and I just really like the 240 hertz experience that this provides, really the visually perfect sample and hold 240 hertz experience with no artifacts, no weaknesses whatsoever in terms of its pixel responses. So even the smallest little details, they're really as sharp as you can expect from a sample and hold 240 hertz experience. I'm on a different scene now, and this scene is really good at highlighting those weaknesses I talked about, even if they're slight weaknesses with the LCD models, because there are a lot of high contrast transitions, a lot of very dark shades combined with much brighter shades and various medium shades. Really nice variety of transitions, but it's really those dark shades that are introduced more here. And in this case, there are just no weaknesses whatsoever. Just really visually perfect experience in terms of the pixel responses. So that's the end of the section now. Uh, not quite. I've got to talk about VRR, variable refresh rate, as well. This monitor does offer VRR. Interestingly enough, it has adaptive sync. That's not particularly interesting, but it does allow you to use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, as well as AMD FreeSync, or FreeSync Premium, more specifically. But interestingly, although the monitor doesn't have HDMI 2.1 ports, it certainly doesn't have the bandwidth of HDMI 2.1, it does actually support HDMI 2.1 VRR. That means you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode via HDMI 2.1. It also means that if you're using a PS5, you should be able to use the VRR support on that. I mean, I don't own a PS5, and I can't confirm this for sure, but the features definitely line up, so I think that's really the main reason they've done this. As a PC user, you're not really going to want to use HDMI because you can't get 240 hertz at the native resolution, but as a console user, you're going to be using HDMI, and it's nice to have the full capabilities in terms of the variable refresh rate support as well. It is nice to be able to use that VRR support. I've increased the graphics settings significantly. It's now dropped down to around 120 frames a second. It sometimes shoots up a little bit beyond that. I now notice an increase in perceived blur because the frame rate is lower, not anything to do with the monitor itself. And I also notice a decrease in connected feel. Again, that's just related to the lower frame rate. But there are, there are no issues in terms of the pixel responsiveness. There's no overshoot or anything. It suddenly pops in just because I'm at a lower refresh rate. So it's really nice to see. And also at this point, I would mention that comparing the 240 hertz on this to the 175 hertz on the Alienware AW3423DW, I do notice a difference. I do appreciate the additional refresh rate on the ASUS. I mean, they both offer a really nice experience in their own ways, but having the 240 hertz OLED experience really is quite something, I have to say. But things aren't perfect when it comes to VRR. The monitor does suffer from VRR flickering, all OLEDs do to some degree, and VA LCDs are particularly bad in this respect. So what happens is when there are changes in the refresh rate, there are also some slight gamma changes that occur at the low end. So that's for darker shades or dark to medium dark shades, really. So I can see flickering or you can see flickering on the video, I'm sure as well for these darker shades here. The brighter shades aren't affected by this. You might be able to see a little bit of what looks like flickering higher up the gradient on the video, but that's actually just from the camera or something it's picking up there. It's not something that uh, I can see by eye. So what this test's doing is it's causing significant fluctuations in refresh rate. You can certainly see this in game as well from time to time, where there are significant fluctuations in refresh rate. 
but unlike VA models, you don't get it throughout the screen. In addition to these gamma changes, which are visible on the OLED because the contrast is so strong, you get some of that on VA models as well, but you also get VRR flickering related to weaknesses in voltage regulation, which means the whole screen can flicker. And that's more noticeable, and actually it can happen even when the frame rate's quite stable in that case. But in this case, it's with the fluctuations in frame rate. Not everyone's gonna notice this or find it bothersome, but I know some people will. And it could be tempting if, if you do find it bothersome. Well, you could disable VRR entirely, but if that's really not an option or not something you want to do, you could consider lowering the refresh rate, perhaps to 120 hertz, depending on what your game is running at, that might mean you can have a stable 120 frames a second rather than having sort of dips from say 200 to 140 frames a second, which may mean this flickering is visible. But on the flip side, you're not gonna be taking advantage of those frame rates above 120 if you do that. And the VRR flickering on this, I did find it a bit more noticeable than on the AW3423DW. I think that the G-Sync module actually has something to do with that. I think it retunes the gamma a little bit. It doesn't eliminate the VRR flickering, but it does seem to improve it a bit. And the reason I say that is not just because of the comparison with these two models. I did do a side-by-side -side comparison with both models set to 120 hertz just to even things out, and I still notice this difference. But actually, I've had users come up to me and say they've tried the AW3423DW as well as some of the other QD OLED ultrawides, and they find them more flickering on the models which don't have the G-Sync module, the adaptive sync monitors. So it does seem that the G-Sync module is actually helping a bit here, but either way I would say that it's not something that's going to bother everyone, it will bother some people, it's just how it is, and it's not specific to this monitor. I'm now at the game running at 60 frames a second, the monitor's running at 60 hertz with VRR, and I'm using NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, by the way, just in case you're wondering, with my RTX 3090. And there are no issues with overshoot even here where you'd expect to see them. We might expect to see them. And that's because OLEDs don't need aggressive pixel overdrive, which can lead to overshoot. They're just natively extremely fast. They don't have to use the same kind of overdrive that LCDs would use. Of course, the connected feel, the perceived blur levels, <laughs> not great because of the low frame rate, but that's not the monitor's fault. That's just how it is. The VRR range of this monitor is claimed to be 40 to 240 hertz. In my testing, it was more like 50 to 240 hertz. Doesn't really make a big difference either way, just something to note. Below the floor of operation, it will use LFC, low frame rate compensation, or in NVIDIA's case, an LFC-like feature. This will mean that the refresh rate of the monitor will stick to a multiple of the frame rates to keep tearing and stuttering at bay, much like you get when you're in the main window of operation. Issue to be aware of though, is that when you pass that boundary, so let's say you go from 51 frames a second to 50 frames a second, the monitor will go from 51 hertz to 100 hertz. That's a significant change in refresh rate, and yes, you do get VRR flickering when that occurs, there's also stuttering, momentary stuttering when this occurs, because there's really no perceived blur from the monitor's pixel responses to mask this. Stuttering in general is more noticeable. And with that in mind, actually, you can notice stuttering, which VRR will not get rid of. I like to call this micro stuttering. Some people will refer to it as micro stuttering. Not everyone's as sensitive to this as other people. I'm particularly sensitive to it, and I do notice it from time to time. But it, it's, you know, it can be caused by issues with the game engine or elsewhere on the system and not necessarily something which VRR technologies can help with. I also noticed a bit more of this on models which don't have a G-Sync module. So I noticed less of this with my AW3423DW. But again, I'm not trying to scaremonger here. Not everyone's gonna be sensitive enough to really notice this. It is something I'm sensitive to, and it's something sensitive users can notice. And that is a point in favor of models which have a G-Sync module if you are sensitive to this kind of thing. But overall, definitely a lot to like about the response performance of this monitor. Really fluid 240 hertz experience in particular. Good support for refresh rates below that as well. The monitor doesn't have BFI, black frame insertion, or a pixel strobing feature, whatever you want to call it. So you are bound by the sample and hold limitations. So you are gonna get a certain level of perceived blur due to that linked to the eye movement. And again, this is explored more in the written review and in the article all about responsiveness on the website, if you're interested in the technical side of things. But I would say that the 240 hertz sample and hold experience with the perfect pixel responses that this offers really is quite something in itself. To wrap up then, the styling of the monitor, very gamery, very rog-like, 
bit less roguelike if you turn off the little red lighting features, I guess. If you use Visa mounting and use your own stand, if you really don't like the general look of the monitor, that will help a bit. But certainly a really nice solid stand base, really nice premium feel to that. Good ergonomic flexibility as well. Being an OLED, there are the limitations to be aware of in terms of your risk of image retention and burn-in. Not specific to this model, not something which I can really test over a very brief period with the review. Something to keep an eye on longer term. But ASUS does claim that the heatsink will help in that respect, and the monitor has other mitigation measures which I've been through in the review as well. The subpixel layout, yes, that does cause some issues with productivity in mind, and I actually found it more bothersome in general than the QD OLED subpixels. It's all very subjective. That's just how I found things. But when I was gaming, watching video content, wasn't an issue. Very strong contrast, as you'd expect from an OLED per pixel illumination. Really impressive in that respect. The screen surface, well, it's regular matte anti-glare, so good glare handling, but that does come with some layering, some graininess, and the fusion of light on the screen surface from your room. I know not everyone likes this kind of thing, but for other people, this kind of screen surface is going to be just fine, or possibly something they actually like. In terms of the colour reproduction, very impressive consistency to the colours from the OLED panel. Nice generous gamut as well, very good DCI-P3 coverage, so good level of vibrancy and a really nice sRGB emulation mode for people who prefer to tone things down, have the more as the developers intend look for your regular SDR content, and that had really nice flexibility. It really shows how such a setting should be implemented. It doesn't lock off any of your controls. The HDR performance of the monitor was largely very impressive. The, the good generous color gamut can be put to good use there. You get the advantages of 10-bit color processing as well. The brightness capabilities is used for limited by the panel used here, but actually they put it to really good use and they managed to really get a brightness experience, just looking at the overall brightness levels, which were quite comparable to what I saw on the QD OLED Ultrawide, and actually in some respects a bit better, depending on how much bright content was being displayed. But there were some limitations where bright shades dominate and the ABL automatic brightness limiter kicked in. I didn't really mention it before, um, but obviously people are gonna be interested in the SDR brightness as well. That's all explored in the written review, but I got around 250 nits without any kind of real ABL, automatic brightness limiter, kicking in. The monitor has a uniform brightness mode, as it's called. And for most users under SDR, this is going to be fine. They're actually, generally, you'll be setting your monitor between 100 and 200 nits. So having it support a bit above that even, that's quite good. But for users who like to have their room particularly bright, really flooded with light, then OLED monitors like this can be a bit limited in that respect. But coming back to HDR, the subpixel layer also caused some limitations there because the monitor's colour volume is decreased. It isn't able to show bright saturated shades. It can only show good brightness from that unfiltered white subpixel, which dilutes things, and it can't show strong saturation at the same time with each subpixel. And it just, just means that some elements didn't look as they should, but that isn't something that everyone's gonna readily notice. It just really depends on if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, I guess, and, and the sort of content you're looking at, the scenes you're looking at, and sort of how you're viewing it. But if you look at the saturation levels for dimmer content and consider bright highlights just as sort of whites, which they mainly are, but not exclusively, the monitor does offer a nice experience overall. Responsiveness was very impressive. The 240 hertz experience on this OLED, really nice. There's no weaknesses from pixel responsiveness in terms of overshoot or slower than optimal pixel responses. Just a really visually perfect sample and hold experience for a given refresh rate. Very low input lag as well. That's not an issue on this monitor. VRR support. Quite surprised actually to see HDMI 2.1 VRR supported, even though the bandwidth of the port is only HDMI 2.0 level, which is why they don't advertise HDMI 2.1. So props to Asus for sort of under advertising rather than over advertising the capabilities in this respect. And the usual adaptive sync experience as well that worked as expected but there was some vrr flickering something that some users are going to be sensitive to others aren't really going to mind so overall there is a lot to like about this monitor it is an expensive monitor it's around 1000 us dollars and as such it's more than twice as much as some competing lcd ips models such as the gigabyte m27 qx but really it's an apples to oranges comparison because you get all of this OLED goodness. Another comparison could be drawn with the QD OLED Ultrawides, and I did that throughout the review really. But overall, I find the Ultrawides nicer for immersive gaming, and 
I did prefer the HDR output on those. I also personally prefer the screen surface. It's a bit more of a focused comparison between the AW3423DW and this model in the conclusion of the written review, if you're interested. Don't have too much more to say about this. They're quite different products in my view. The 240 hertz, really for more competitive gaming or a mixture of competitive gaming and other uses, I do feel the 240 hertz experience that this provides is really quite something. And there are other models which use this panel as well, the LG 27GR95QE, which I'll be reviewing in the near future. That might already be available on our channel, depending on when you're viewing this video. So I'll be sure to draw a few comparisons there. But as I understand it, the ASUS does have better brightness capability, even though they share the panel. The LG, though, it has hardware calibration and it has a remote, which some people like, for controlling the OSD. And it also has full HDMI 2.1 capability. So that's really all there is to the ASUS ROG Swift OLED PG27AQDM. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Also be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, a nice way of showing your support.